This is our first workshop of this scale, so it's uh, really exciting. Um, and thinking about uh, what to call this thing, uh, you know, the, you guys came on an invitation based on an executive workshop for generative AI. Well, the title I'd really like to share with you, one that occurs to us all the time is, shit, AI is a really big deal. I'm sure you guys feel that. Um, you see it, and we hope to help frame a lot of that uh, for you today and tomorrow. But I want to help you see where we think it's going, not just in terms of a technology, but in terms of how it will affect what companies do, how they go to market, and what customers expect of you. So each of you are part of a, a company, and I think it's going to be easy to say, it is very easy to say, um, you're going to be deeply affected by it. You cannot avoid this. I'll be obvious, but I want to spell that out a little bit more. And uh, maybe the, the hint of where I'm going to go with this is the title, you know, if I just had my, had my whim, the title for this is really how AI will create squishy interfaces. And I, that's a, it's an interesting idea. It's one I want to leave you with. If you were to just walk out the door right now, I want you to ruminate on that. Then I'm going to give you a little flesh around what that means. Because I think that's where things start to really radically shift how companies interface with the world. So, first of all, why us? Why am I here at Argo Design listening to them talk about AI? A good question. First of all, our first customer, our first paycheck 10 years ago was with an AI company. Um, we were fortunate to learn a lot of the, the sort of underlying um, mechanism of AI before we even got to worry about how it might interface with customers. We spent a whole lot of time helping what essentially were AI engineers deliver in a more efficient way. So we got a real lens on the tooling and I think that gave us a nice perspective. I'm not going to go into our portfolio. This is about you guys, but it gave us, I think a real perspective. Then last year, generative AI happened, right? It's been taking a while, but it sort of hit a crescendo and we dove in deep. And I think throughout all this, it's a self-serving statement in one respect, but I think it's something you will all click on here. At the end of the day, just like any advance in computing, when the interface catches up, when the way, and I don't mean broadly just the, the interface as in the user, the, the GUI, but the way users can come at a technology when that arrives at a certain level, when it changes to be sufficiently accessible by the world, then the technology explodes. And we're seeing that begin to happen. So I want to set up that argument for you. The argument begins really simple. You've probably played with, I hope you've played with GPT, and you've experienced this basic idea of create a prompt, you get some really interesting text back. What's not been put on the table yet, but when you look at broadly at how computing has made a difference in all kinds of other places is, you take and you understand something about that person, right? You know, like if you shop on Amazon, they already have a, a story about you. And so the kind of content they're putting on the table is already quite advanced, as opposed to just sort of throwing the whole catalog at you. So. I, in, entering into the argument, who you are and what you've been doing in the past, the context of your moment, where are you? Maybe you're here in a meeting and you're, you're drawing an inquiry. Maybe you're at home doing the laundry and you're drawing an inquiry. Those, that context can radically change the argument. That's coming. That will start to happen. But what really makes that possible is adding depth of interface. Right now, prompts are the sort of primary interface, right? We have to type something out and we're getting good at that. People are getting really good at prompt engineering. But the truth is it's sort of a, like people getting really good at DOS uh, in, in the pursuit of better computing. That, that has a terminal uh, uh, point to it. You re we really are looking for the era of windows in, in this analogy. Okay, on the output end, 
we see a lot of text. And of course, we're getting even better at producing media, right? Directly kind of producing a, a picture or, you know, lately we've been able to produce some interesting video. Okay, so all these arguments now are producing a little bit better asset. But in the end, you're sort of asking for a picture and you get a picture and that, that's not going to radically change things. But if we see now, oh, we're generating code. And we have lately, and I hope many of you have explored this idea, generating actually useful code. Now to a developer, that's been amazing, but most of us are not developers. And here's where it gets crazy. So the basic formula is if we can generate good enough code, we can generate good enough text responses, we can generate some media, we can put together essentially interfaces that give someone access to this power in the moment that they're in, whether it be a business challenge or a personal moment, and we can bring to them a running piece of software. This is the end state that we need to be thinking about. When we talk about AI and how AI is gonna change our business, take this picture into that argument as opposed to thinking it a, of it as some back-end process that our supply chain folks are going to take up. That's going to happen. That's great. But it's not the radical proposition to a business that you really need to be trying to digest and trying to plan on and build your company strategies around. We know this is going to happen because we're working with a particular customer called Builder, dot AI. And they're doing this. Um, I think Jan's going to show a couple of clips from it. Uh, again, we could have a side conversation. I don't want to go into uh, our work so, um, so much. But in short, this is an application where a person can, and you can go to builder.ai today, right now, and talk to it in a conversation or text with it and describe the app you want. And it will lay out what it thinks are all the necessary screens and code elements to make that app. Just from your description, hey, I, I, I've got a shoe store. We're selling nice uh, men's business shoes. I want it to look really kind of formal, et cetera, et cetera. You just talk your way through it and boom, there's an app. And right now they take a couple of weeks to finish that app and then they deliver it onto the app store. But you need to see the linear argument here. At some point, that'll just hand the app to you after the argument. And at some point, that won't be a creative exercise. It'll just be in the moment I need an app to do something for me, I'll reorganize the books on my bookshelf. I want you to think about what AI is doing to how people interact with computers at that level. And that goes to sort of some bigger, hairier arguments. Um, yeah, I've been a product designer now for 35 years or so. And I have lived like everyone in the last hundred years under this idea of we create a thing. All of you in terms of being part of companies, uh, your company creates the product or service offline, thinking about your customers. So what do we know about them? What have they asked for in the past? And you concoct your service, your offering in remove from your customer, right? Not in front of them. And then you, you're trying to imagine also a mass idea of the customer, a cohort as sometimes as big as all of your customers at once. And you then deliver that service, hoping that that averaging you did is satisfying to all of them in their particulars. This is every company's challenge and trying to narrow and customize that and the expense of constantly more precisely addressing each of those customers. It's a, it's a huge challenge. It is the sort of modern industrial problem. And all software is really thought of this way. But life isn't really like that. There's these little moments where you're trying to stitch together a birthday party. There is no app for something as ad hoc as this. If you're trying to buy life insurance, the process in your mind comes together in this, and this is where Squishy comes into mind. In this squishy process, your mind sort of concocts how you might want to do it. But the truth is the insurance companies have their process and they want you to run through that. 
You're trying to set up a Kubernetes container, right? Set up a cloud instance. Same thing. All of the business problems are this challenge between the wind, uh, the rigidity of a business's model of how they want to engage a customer and the squishiness of how humans really like to get things done. That's a fundamental opportunity for any business. One way to look at this, I love this is Jared's argument. Um, we've since, since adopted it and sort of thinking about this. Machines, software, hardware, started being just simple mechanical expressions, right? And so you would bring your intelligence to the table, right? Your idea of how to wash something. If you don't know how to wash it, the machine's not gonna, not necessarily gonna help you. We took and categorized a lot of those models, right? What's, a, what's the best way to wash a stain out or best way to wash something delicate? And we put those into individual models. And largely this is where software is today. Whether you're buying insurance or trying to set up a cloud instance or shopping online, we tra tried to sort of create a, a, a prototypical or, or archetypical model for people, and ask them to play through that. But the real opportunity I'm reiterating here is that software, hardware, the built world of which you guys are part of can be designed on the fly, can be served up on the fly by intelligent machines. This is fundamentally how people will, you know, if a child's born today, I think this is how they'll see things. That a great deal of the things they interact with come together in that moment for them in the way that they see it. We'll still have, oh, they'll go to that thought in a second. <laughs> um, we're talking about basically is a great deal of unstructured interaction. So much of the built world is about, here's a structured way you need to interact with. We're talking about ephemeral applications, things that happen in the moment, they come together to serve that need, software that is available then and then it's gone. It doesn't need to stay. We don't need to store, we, we do today. Think about it, millions and millions of applications out in the world, they're just sort of stored there waiting to be invoked by people in hopes that it's the, you know, the right piece of software for that moment. It's, a, it's an idea of a very sort of quantum internet, right? The internet doesn't really exist as a set of stored things to go visit. It's, a, it's an internet that comes together in the way that you need it to in the moment. So let it, um, yeah, a sort of a real time internet. It's all a sort of a mix of ideas rather than putting our finger on it. Sort of let all of these sort of ruminate. Again, it's all about the interface and the idea that we've been forcing a lot of squishy human process into our hard structured businesses. A couple of other deep thoughts uh, and where this stuff goes, because there's a lot of secondary effects to this. A deep reminder that we've come up with all of this technology, that we're all participant in an industry that often needs to be reminded that the purpose of all of this is to help people just get things done. It's not about the machine itself. Um, we all live under this sort of onus of standards and canon, and when something can be invented on the fly, it will recast the meaning of this. Right now, it's a sort of default that you build against a set of standards for how an application might work, what kind of features are available, but when it's dynamically creatable, do you allow style? How much flexibility, how much um, standard, of op standard operational procedures do you inject into that? Because you don't have to anymore. Do you do it just out of lazy habit or do you start to reconsider a lot of those things that your company does now with new intent? It's a big open question. Um, it also means brands will have to rethink themselves. The last 10 years, 20 years, brands have found a door through software in a lot of ways, right? We know Uber by the Uber app. We know a lot of brands through 
their functionality. We don't necessarily need to know the name of that brand or interact with it in any meaningful way. There are some that will, will be stable, but there are a lot that just don't need to exist. They're just features in a new universe like this. So it will cause a lot of consternation for companies to write sort of, and this happened already, right? With the internet, brands had to recast themselves. And honestly, they've had a heyday in the sense that any application could be the excuse to be a brand. And we've seen a lot of wonderful brands uh, well, not so wonderful brands become part of everyday lexicon because of software. Facebook is a brand, but it is really access to your friends. Do you, you know, it's a, it's a rhetorical question, but do you need to know that them? Do you need to know what they do or just do you need that access to that functionality? Uh, it, it means things like provenance, which sort of come baked with where and how you access information. Uh, becomes everyone's new problem, right? Uh, look, sometimes it doesn't matter. In provenance, mis where, where you don't understand where the wine comes from, can just be judged in terms of what it tastes like. You don't need to know whether it's cheap or expensive wine. Uh, but in the case of important information, it starts to become a problem when things are single source, when they're coming through just the, a dynamically delivered result to your query, to your prompt. Uh, we have a, a, a fairly recent example where Stack Overflow, some, a place where engineers would go for kind of trusted advice between other engineers about how to solve something. And now just asking, asking GPT. So now that everyone, you know, more and more people are asking one single source, there's very little provenance to those uh, to those recommendations and now are sort of losing track. And of course it's dragging down a business is the other part of the headline. That's, that's gotta happen. The bigger issue, the, the one that will affect everyone is, you know, how to trust the sources of information. We have to recast that. I'm not worried about it being solvable. It will be solved, but it definitely is a recasting of how to trust information. Uh, it's a lot of fun can be had, a lot of sort of creativity. The idea of mass communications will turn to a sort of a mass personalized. You could conceivably in a few years just rewatch Star Wars, but with all of the characters replaced by cats. It's totally possible. Uh, you're probably gonna grow up, uh, your kids will probably grow up in a world where the ads they see online will be rendered at them, not the same ad for a hundred thousand or a million people, but an ad per person, an article per person, all content per person. So what you imagine yourself in the ideal look and place with those running shoes that you're thinking about buying will be delivered to you in that, in, in what way that the the intelligence behind it can, can, uh, can think, can conceive of. It does mean a lot more headroom to imagine more. I think companies, are, and this is what today's about. This is, if, if nothing else, today's uh, helping you sort of lift above the AI as a technical set of capabilities into, oh man, how do I rethink how we engage our customers? Um, it also means, and I think we're going to have this sort of myopic problem for a while uh, where we're not sure what's possible. It, it's actually an ironic thing when everything's possible, you end up a bit stumped uh, in terms of how much things will change. So it's going to challenge us for a while until we get some new sort of lines of thinking to emerge. Uh, look, this isn't about uh, me saying mixed reality is going to take over. It's not. But it is um, an example, this push for mixed reality. There's some aspects of it that are very misplaced. But there's some aspects that are essentially the industry's anxiety trying to take and introduce computing more into the context of life, whether it be on a factory floor, in a large corporate office, or at home, the computer is essentially dumb 
to most of the context of what you as a person or a group of people face and to be able to bring that into that context so that the questions are driven with that context, with that intelligence, is necessary to advance the story of computing and to grow the quality of services and offerings that companies have. And the interface has to help with that. And that's why we keep coming up with this answer, but it's a clumsy answer. But it does mean, you know, if you step back from that, just a complete rethink to what it means to interface with your customers. And it also, you know, last point here, I know it's a hugely philosophical question, but it's, I, I like to end on these type of questions. It sort of forces all of us to, when anything can be made, when anything can be sort of written and, and uh, portrayed because of generative AI, through generative AI, um, it makes us turn back to, well, what's human? What's, what do we really need? What's valuable about just us? You know, you could create a million Mona Lisas in a query, really, literally. I mean, Matthew, make us a million, where's my, he, he's, yeah. You literally, it's crazy. And so what happens to the original? I do think we, we end up having to question that and um, come to, I think, new terms about what, what's valuable about it. And that, that happens in, in work too. So it's not really just about art, but it's about how we value what we're delivering to our customers. So to me, this is a huge opportunity. This doesn't happen that often where technology just completely upends how business engages, how the people will want to engage each other. That to me is super exciting. I'm glad you're here to talk about that and help figure out how your small slice of the world might change from that. I hope it's useful to you today. We've got a lot of content for you and you are also half the content. So <laughs> you can't just sit back and go, okay, um, you're gonna be part of this. So let's have fun. Thank you. Thank you.